Good morning. Uh, and my goodness, this conference has become big. Uh, I attended the first one, and it's like uh, tripled in size, I would imagine. Uh, clearly, the Arctic is just generating so much more interest these days and uh, on a variety of fronts, as we all know. But before speaking, because you've probably heard a lot of speaking, I just want to show you a one and a half minute film just to make us relax a little bit. The white button? The green. in the Arctic and it's been amazing, you know, stepping onto shores where you see bare footprints and we're moving across the landscape. And I, I think amongst all of us, you had this feeling that you were eavesdropping in on one of these beautiful scenes of nature and how much we want it to always be here. That's a very special part of coming on a journey like this. By being here and feeling the sense of the place, the land, the plants, the wildlife. We've run into the largest animal ever to live on the planet, a blue whale. And it, there he is. It's not just what we're seeing here, it's the approach that we take when we come upon these extraordinary things that we've been witnessing. When we see life, or icebergs, or birds, or walrus, or whales there, something happens to us. We're inside this very special moment of intensified consciousness called exploration and discovery. So I, I've been at this for a very long time. Uh, I, I, I'm 66 now, and I say, how did it all happen so fast? Uh, and I just want to tell you a very brief story about going back to 1973, because my goodness, the world has changed since that time. Uh, in 1973, I left Reykjavik uh, on my way to Greenland uh, on a ship called the Lindblad Explorer, a ship my father built, which was the first purpose-built expedition ship in the world. And we were approaching Greenland, and the ice was incredibly thick, and there was lots of multi-year ice. But we found some channels, and we were able to navigate towards the continent. And it took us about a day and a half before we realized that this probably wasn't going to happen. And the wind changed, and it pulled the ice back behind the ship, and we were locked solidly locked in the ice with a very large iceberg right in front of the bow and being pushed against it. And uh, I, had a f I had this feeling that it was going to be like the Endurance, uh, where Shackleton's ship was crushed in the ice. And uh, I was 23, and I was a little bit nervous about the whole thing. And then two days later, the wind shifted and, and opened up a lee behind us, and we were able to, to get out. And it just, it made me realize how, how, how complex this environment is in many, many ways if you want to explore it. Uh, you must never take it for granted. It's got challenges that come and go depending on any number of factors. The ice, of course, is, is such a dominant feature in the Arctic, and we all know it's shrinking. And I think a lot of people just assume that it's getting, there's less and less of it, and therefore it's easier and easier and they forget that, uh, that things change periodically, that there are these micro circumstances that, that, that make it very, very challenging. There is going to be an explosion of growth uh, as it relates to marine tourism in the Arctic and in the Antarctic and polar regions in the next several years, really commencing in, in, in earnest in 2019. I, I was stunned this year in March there were so many announcements about people who were entering this field and building ships. Uh, something like 10 new expedition ships will be delivered to various companies in 2019. And they'll be wandering all over the place because, as the gentleman before said, that the polar regions are, there's the perception of and the reality of, that they're safer, they're, 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 
there, there's not so much uh, conflict as there is in many other parts of the world, and many other parts of the world are just getting more and more crowded. And so these ships are looking for areas where they can bring people, there are less crowds, there's less concern about issues like terrorism and Zika and whatever. So they're coming, and they're going to come in a big way. I don't necessarily mind personally that there is growth uh, in tourism in places like the Arctic, but I do worry about that people might underestimate the challenges involved in doing so. I mean, we had a discussion the other day in my office with uh, some of our key field people, uh, the people who, who, who hire and train and develop our expedition leaders and the people who hire and develop our captains and officers. And we were talking a lot about being ready for our own growth in the years to come to make sure that we have people that are trained, really well trained to be able to handle the polar regions, particularly when they throw you some curves and when they get complicated, and they do periodically, and you can count on it. So I do worry a little bit about the fact that we're going to have a lot of people running around who may not have the level of respect or the level of experience, and they may get in trouble, and we have to just understand that that is highly likely to happen. I mean, if you look at Antarctic tourism and you really go back through the records and you see the number of accidents that have happened, it, it's, it's a bit frightening. That ship that I was on in that multi-year ice in 1973 sunk in the Antarctic in 2007. In similar conditions, actually, multi-year sea ice, except the captain wasn't knowledgeable about what he was doing. By the way, we didn't have it anymore, just to be clear. It had been sold many, many years before. And he was driving the ship too fast into multi-year ice and put a big gash in the side. The first passenger ship to sink in the Antarctic. Fortunately, no lives were lost, but it was, uh, it was very, very tragic. The other complexity is, I mean, you know, we have to figure out how to integrate the idea of obviously the environment, nature, human communities, commerce, politics. I mean, it, it's quite staggering how many eyes are now on the Arctic from the perspective of, of perceived opportunity in so many different ways. And it seems to be happening so, so fast. Um, and those are going to present challenges, of course, that we have to sort of somehow reconcile. And forums like this, of course, are extremely helpful in helping to build understanding between sectors, sectors that need to cooperate in order to build a, uh, a thriving, safe, respectful future for this very, very special part of the world. Speaking of human communities, I just because that often seems to be one of the last considerations there are so many communities spread out all over the Arctic, as you all well know. And one of the things that I think is incumbent upon us is to, is to understand those communities better, to understand their rights, to understand their aspirations. Um, it's hard because you come in and you visit a place, a small town in, in, in Arctic Canada or Greenland, and you come ashore with, with, with tourists, or travelers, as we prefer to call them. And you try and create an interaction that's meaningful, both for the community and for the traveler, so that everybody gets value out of that exchange. Not just economic value, but value in a multitude of forms. And it's, it's hard, and we all have to work on that, I think, much, much harder. And I just want to introduce you to a lady, because I'd really like you to pay attention to her work. Uh, Jenny Kingsley, would you just stand up for a second? So seek this lady out if you have a moment and go to a place called hashtag meet the north. Uh, Jenny's been working for a couple of years on uh, telling the stories of Arctic peoples. She goes and lives in communities, builds friendships, builds trust, and finds ways to bring out their stories about the reality of their lives told from their perspective, not from an outsider's perspective, but in their voices. And uh, I think that's a great help to, 
to build our understanding for these peoples. I love the Arctic. I love the Antarctic. I love any place that's wild. And sometimes I have to be careful because it might, you know, some of my opinions might seem self-serving. Uh, I frankly do not like large passenger ships in places like the Arctic for a variety of reasons. I don't think it's really possible to give people the ability to experience what this place is if you're a thousand people or two thousand people. As challenging as it is to develop these relationships with small communities when you're a hundred people, you can just imagine what it's like with a thousand people or two thousand people. In a way, I think it commoditizes to some degree this very, very, very special place. And so I hope, and it scares me a little bit when I see the beginnings of that, because the tourism industry is a ravenous industry. Uh, and they tend to follow each other like lemmings. Uh, and once you open a gate, there can be a real, real, real flood of activity. And so we all have to be mindful of the fact that they're coming. Lots more people are coming or want to come. And that does have opportunity, but it also has peril. And we should be mindful of that as those of you who are in the decision-making communities um, envision how the future of the Arctic will develop. So I'm going to leave it at there because I'd really hope we have some time for questions. Thank you very much.